Well, I have a very special guest in the studio right now, um, Facebook friend, um, known actually. I knew you before you moved. Uh, John Neff has a long, long history here uh, in radio and engineering. Um, actually, you helped build some of the studios that uh, we've done, and you worked in some of the radio stations that we now still have and have gone and evolved over the years. So welcome, John. Thank you. It's good to be here. So we're going to talk a little bit about your history. And, um, of course, you loved Maui, and it was interesting. Doing studio work on Maui, it, you know, is it's kind of an interesting mix of trying to get the latest, greatest equipment back in what year was that? 85, I opened my first studio here in Maui. And you did that with the help of Walter Becker from Steely Dan, right? No, that was uh, 1989. That was oh. my last studio here. I had three oh. of them all together. Oh, I didn't know that. So your first studio was 85? Yes. And then, that was that up country as well? No, that was on Derry Road. Oh, gosh, back then. Okay, so and then what was the next studio? Uh, well, the first, the first uh, iteration was at the Thompson Ranch. Oh, really? And then I, I got busy, and it was too disruptive up there, so we I, we moved to the Dairy Road studio. That was the first one I actually built. So that's the house that uh, that Oprah now owns. Yeah, I know that. She owns the old ranch. Yeah, I think it's been done over, but believe me, I have not been invited. <laughs> well, how rude. <laughs> no, you don't get to get up there unless you know someone, you know? <laughs> or if you're kind of a big star. Um, but it must have been interesting because the, the view up there and the energy up there is just gorgeous, right? Yes. Beautiful. And so so you did that one that was the third one you did down um, down the road near past Sun Yat-sen? Past Sun Yat-sen, uh, just a mile before the Ulupalakua Ranch uh, on seven acres surrounded by the vineyard. How nice. And it was, we were right above the Grand Wailea hotel which we saw them light up uh for the first time and uh it was amazing because uh we were standing out on the deck we had a beautiful view of the ocean and kahoholave and uh uh uh, molokini and west maui and um that when they lit up the hotel it went one wing at a time and it was just like boom wow bright boom bright boom bright (laughs) boom bright and uh, all of a sudden, the whole thing was lit up. Wow. It was amazing. I'm trying to remember the year that was. That would have been 90, I um, think. Just after I got here. Yeah, you know, I got here in 80. Well, I lived here in 86 for a while, and then I got came back, and we got the stations in 89. But So when you built, did you live up there at the studio, or did you have a separate house? No, I lived in Keokea. Oh, okay. Keokea is beautiful. So that yeah. hasn't changed that much. No, Mrs. Ching is still there. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. So you moved after Maui. Where did you go? I went to Phoenix. Oh. And because I had lived there in the 70s, and I love Arizona as a state. Uh, geographically, it's, it's a beautiful place. And um, I built a big studio there, and uh, that was a mistake because uh, everybody with any money went to L.A. because it was only a one-hour plane flight away. Yeah. So yeah. I did three albums and a couple of car commercials because we had a video shooting stage, too. Mm. And uh, That must have cost a fortune to build. It was. Wow. We had a psych in a cove and uh, green screen walls and My the whole gosh. business. Did you have an investor? Yes, that? I had two partners. So is that still there? Uh, no. Oh, too bad. Yeah. Wow. Uh, we, we couldn't maintain it. It yeah. was just too expensive. I bet. So then did you go to L.A.? Then I went to Los Angeles, and I uh, started a technical design firm uh, called Tectone Engineering with uh, uh, the architects who had built the Maui studio and my Phoenix studio. Oh. And they hired me. Well, we went in as partners uh, on a new firm that would do the technical design for studios. So they would do the architecture supervise the building and then i would do all you know spec out the console and uh design the patch bay and uh spec out the uh outboard equipment in the racks and all that and how it would uh, all be grouped together and uh then we would uh, purchase the equipment and install it 
What year was that? 1995 till 1997 for me. Still kind of busy. I mean, you know, it's interesting when we think back about studios because I know a lot of people with studios now that are having a hard time because a lot of people just get their own little computer set up and they do it in their computers at home. You know what I'm saying? Have you seen that happen, that trend where people are saying, well, I can do it myself and then send out the rest for mastering or something, mixing and mastering somewhere else? Well, what they don't have is a good room for recording, especially That's drums. True. That's true. And then uh, and they don't have the microphones. Yep. Like uh, I have a studio in Portland, Oregon, and uh, I mix films there as well as uh, do music projects. And I've got a really good recording room, and uh, I've got 80 microphones. What? Yeah, I've got all the big microphones. So, oh, my. I can't even imagine 80 microphones. Why do you need 80 <laughs> microphones? They're all different colors on the palette. What's your favorite? Uh, the Telefunken Tube U47. That's that's supposed to be one of the best. Yeah. That's How a, much did that cost? 10000 bucks. Wow. Actually, that's that, not bad for that. I yeah. bought that for the Journey album. So that's probably even gone up in value since you bought it. Yes, it has. Yeah, because you can't get that anymore. Not easily. Yeah. Yeah. And doing films, you have to have probably special equipment for sound effects because you do sound effects and everything, right? Yes. I, when I mix a film, I do the, uh, I clean up the production sound and get it all regulated, uh, uh, remove comments and set noises and things like that, fill in gaps with room tone. And then, uh, then I do the Foley and sound effects. Uh, Foley is generally the effects that you have to hear because you see it in the frame. Uh, if you are the actress in the film, there's a boom microphone on you and it records your dialogue. But if there's people in the background in a restaurant scene or something, uh, the boom microphone does not pick up the clinking of the glasses and silverware and plate noises and all that stuff. So I have to add all that in. There's a real art to this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and people don't realize, unless they see a film without the sound, you have no idea how important the sound is. And you worked with David Lynch. Nine years. And he's probably a perfectionist as well, isn't he? Yes, he is. So you had to know what he was looking for, and sometimes it'd probably be off the wall, wasn't it, working with David Lynch? Oh, we had our days. <laughs> it was fun. He did an animated series for his website called Dumbland. And normally for animation, you record the soundtrack first and then draw to the soundtrack. Well, he drew the whole thing first, and then we had to make the soundtrack fit the cartoons. Mm. And uh, But there's no production sound in animation. You have to make everything you see. Wow. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. So you're really literally creating a world of sound. Literally. So how much time did that take? Uh, about a week per episode. Wow, I can't imagine. The one thing I do know, having tried to do video uh, for a while, is the detail work in editing. Mm -hmm. And sound is, and when you're doing especially sound effects and sounds, must be really, really key and important, right? Yes, and you have to sync to picture. You have to make the sounds when you see the image. Uh -huh. So you basically have a recording session where you record... 10 times the audio you need and then you find just the perfect one that fits the picture and then you have to sync it up uh, in Pro Tools to make it uh, work with the picture. What's your latest film project? It's called Night Rain. It's a film about, it's a story of uh, Elizabeth Short who was the notorious uh, Black Dahlia murder victim in Los Angeles in 1947. This is the, there have been other Black Dahlia films, but this is the first one that has focused on her life and is sympathetic to her as a character, ah. as a human being. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, it's shot part contemporary and part neo-noir in black and white. Wow. And it's, it's a very interesting film. It's uh, almost done. It'll be, uh, it's actually going to show at the Mill Valley Film Festival. Oh, fun, fun. Yeah. Now, you did Long Story Short. Straight Story. Straight, st sorry, Straight Story. That was my first feature film for David Lynch. And uh, it's a beautiful story about Alvin Strait, who uh, couldn't drive anymore. He was an elderly man. 
and he uh, built a little homemade trailer and hooked it up to his riding lawnmower and drove across Iowa and Wisconsin to visit his estranged brother who had had a stroke. I saw that, and I really felt like there was nothing I had ever seen before like that. It did pretty well, didn't it? It did all right. Mm -hmm. David's films don't do big box office. They do big sell-through to the DVD market Uh and Uh now Blu-ray, but uh, uh, they don't do so well in the theaters. He's a niche market. It definitely is. Definitely is. And you did um, a CD with him? Oh, yeah. David and I have an album out together called Blue Bob which we recorded between 98 and 2000. And uh, uh, it's real heavy uh, guitars and uh, uh, percussion. Some of the uh, percussion is industrial machines that I <laughs> created loops. Oh, you play guitar. I played guitar and bass on this and my guitar castro, which is a MIDI driven or a guitar driven MIDI rig. Wow. I want to talk to you about the Twin Falls episode because, I mean, I want to talk to you a little bit because I know I've been following you on Facebook and you went back and there was a Twin Falls kind of reunion. Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks. (laughs) That's right. Twin Peaks reunion, right? Yes. And what was that like? It was wonderful. There were cast members uh, from the original show and from The Return, which was uh, an 18-episode third season that David did two years ago that I had music in, by the way. And um, when did uh, it first come out? I can't remember now. Nineteen ninety. It was there was, again. There was nothing like it when it first came out. No, it changed television forever. I mean, and people tried to figure out what each character meant, you know. And then there was some backward recording, right? And oh things, yeah, the little man. The little man. What was and must have been very strange trying to figure out what you could get away with in that and what you can't, right? Did you kind of had to push the limits, right? Yeah. And did people try to figure out what was being said? Well, um, in the movie Fire Walk With Me, there were some subtitles. But uh, uh, on the television show, there weren't. And and people just had to listen and try and figure it out. What was it like at Twin Peaks from the pictures I saw up there? It was pretty interesting. Oh, yeah. We went to various filming locations. Um, There was a uh, David Lynch movie night. They showed Blue Velvet this year. Oh. And um, which I mixed in surround when I worked for David. And uh, Rebecca Del Rio performed, and I performed with her our song No Stars, which is in Twin Peaks. You actually performed there? Yes. Wow. That must have been amazing. Yep. (laughs) Wow. And a lot of people came. It was sold out. The theater capacity is 300, and uh, that determines how many people go to the uh, uh, festival. That's amazing. So, it really did it. The 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 movie and the the TV show did it change that area forever? Um, I remember years ago, I first went to the Twin Peaks Festival in 2002 and played opening for Julie Cruz, and um. Uh, the townspeople didn't like it. Ah. They didn't like the notoriety. They didn't like the uh-huh. fact that Twin Peaks, the television show, exposed the underbelly of a small town and a lot of the creepy things that went on. Uh-huh. So they were not fans of the festival. But now the Chamber of Commerce puts up <laughs> signs and they welcome everybody and the stores and bars have <laughs> Twin Peaks fan uh specials and uh uh they name drinks after agent cooper and all kinds of things like that it's it's become quite a tradition so because of the money involved the bringing you the business i think so yeah yeah i mean because where exactly is it north bend washington snoqualmie washington and fall city wow so it's it's still a small town though oh yeah yeah so you had to really make sure you got your spaces together really early because it's got to be booked out, right? Yeah, but I was a guest of the festival. So they had a whole hotel they stayed at or something? The Salish, which was the Great Northern Hotel on uh, the television show, right at the top of Snoqualmie Falls, had a beautiful view of the river. So what was it like to go back and do that and feel that? Well, I go almost every year. Uh-huh. So... uh 
it's like going home in a certain way. Uh-huh. Um, I'm usually a guest of the festival, and uh, so I'm on the celebrity panel and things like that. And uh, they treat me really nice. It's it's kind of amazing what you've been able to do and how that whole connection worked with you and David Lynch and then Twin Peaks and and then what brought you to the point where you got your own studio in in Portland after that? Well, I had a studio in Marin County uh, for a number of years on uh, Tamales Bay in Inverness, mm-hmm. and um, so I had all the gear. And then I built a great big studio in uh, Nicasio, uh, uh, in Marin County, Central mm-hmm. Marin County, and uh, that was uh, almost three million bucks. And uh, it was a fifty-six hundred square foot home and studio. Wow. Well, the the mortgage company that we were in contract with post construction, excuse me. <clears throat> went out of business in the banking crash. Oh, my. And everyone raised the qualification bars, and we were not able to qualify for a takeout loan. And I should have stopped construction and walked away from it, but I didn't. I I built it, and uh, and then we lost it to foreclosure. So my kids, who live in Portland, decided I was going to move there. And so they moved me up there. Amazing. And now you're doing uh, all these soundtracks, these movies and uh, projects, and working with some new artists as well, right? Yes, I, I work with a lot of developing Portland artists as well as uh, uh, some of the more established bands there who may have three, four albums out already, and they come to me to make their new record. Uh, I produce a woman named Christy Joseph, uh, who I've done three albums for, and I play bass in her band, and um, uh, she's a real affirmative, uh, positive uh, person, and it shows in her music. And um, uh, But then also I mix films from all around the world. Well, I, I'm really impressed at how you have evolved and survived and thrived um, through lots of challenges in life and, and are doing these amazingly creative things. And I, I really do hope you get your book out. Um, I know you wrote the basis of one, and you need to maybe add on more of the Lynch years to it. But I yes. know, I know, I'd love to read it. And there's things about you I, I've learned just talking to you today that I, even though I've known you for years, I didn't realize you were involved in. So um, it's really an interesting part of our rock and roll history, and 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 you had some amazing things happen there. So um, you know, I just uh, it's really a treat um, to have you come to Maui and to sit down and and have time to just talk a little bit about um, how the journey's led you and the path that's taken you um, to where you are right now. I call it my accidental career. That's a good name for a book. <laughs> no, or a CD. Uh-huh. That, either, either or both, you know, because now you do the, the book and then you read it anyway, so you could do that too, you know. I'm just, just saying you could. I'm, I, I'd love to do that with you. Um, and uh, just a big, big mahalo, um, just really a, a true treat and pleasure to have the time to spend with you here and to look back and uh, to some of our histories and what you've been up to. And um, it's it's just wonderful to see your success as well. So thank you. Uh, big, big aloha and um, super mahalos to you. Same to you.